big welcome from my side to the main event of today, reaching the sustainable development goals with AI. My name is Michael Feigelmann and I am part of the KI Garage and together with my magnificent co-moderator today, Karina, we will both guide you through today's evening. Thanks, Michael, and welcome everyone to um, this amazing event tonight. I'm very happy that you all joined us for our first on-site event from Women in AI and Robotics. Um, I've been involved with Women in AI and Robotics for over a year now, and uh, since the beginning of this year, I'm also leading our activities in Stuttgart and Baden-Württemberg. Um, our president, Sheila Beladijenat, and I will later tell you more about our network. And after the keynote, I will also moderate the panel discussion on the key topic of today, which is about how we can reach the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals with AI. At this point, I also want to thank uh, our partner, uh, the KI Garage and Michael. We worked together over the last months to make this amazing event happen uh, for you. Also to uh, um, the team of Stuttgart from Women in AI and Robotics who helped me uh, on our side. And of course, the Stiftung Baden-Württemberg for inviting us to this venue here. So thanks a lot. And yeah, with this, back to Michael and have a, a nice evening with us. Thank you very much, Karina. And please, a big applause for my co-moderator, Karina. <laughs> so some of you already had some very insightful workshops already with um, our colleagues from Statworks and Patricia about the topics of SDG and sustainable AI. And um, now we will proceed with our main event where we will bring together two of the most and most relevant and current topics of nowadays, sustainability and AI. And before I start with the agenda of today, I would also like to say thank you to the Baden-Württemberg Stiftung for hosting us tonight, especially to Mr. Dahl, Mr. Weber and Ms. Weyers and the whole organizational team around it. Thank you very much for having us as your guests today. And. Um, this is what we've planned for you today. We have sorted out a hopefully very entertaining program for you. Um, we'll start off with a few welcoming words by the Baden-Württemberg Stiftung and Women in AI and Robotics. We'll then go over to our fantastic keynote by Mrs. Professor Dr. Yivka Ovcharova, who will talk about operations with AI, digital twins and virtual reality. And then our main part of the event will take place. We invited today people from Google, the director of the FZE, and the CEO of a consulting company in terms of sustainability. And after that, to round up the evening, we will meet up each other in the follow-up networking sessions with food and drinks, roughly around 7.15, 7.20 this night. Um, I hope and invite everybody to stay a little bit longer to get in contact with every of our speakers, panelists and event partners. And um, just a few quick words about the KI Garage and what we do and I promise I will try to keep it as short as possible. With us at the KI Garage, you can experience an ecosystem where AI expertise meets entrepreneurial spirit. This means if you have an AI idea and considering of founding a company, and especially an AI startup, then we are the ones to talk to in Baden-Württemberg. We help you with workshops, accelerator programs, and events like this year to connect you with people who will help you to gain knowledge and money. And to execute this program, dear audience, we will need your help. In October this year, we will start with our next network accelerator, where we will help up to 12 AI startups to transfer their AI idea into a sustainable business. So if you think that you can help as an AI mentor in roughly 90 minutes online sessions, then you are happily invited to join us. Please feel free to reach out to us during the networking session or via mail or LinkedIn. And now let's get to the people who made all of this here around us possible. I'm really honored to have with us today the former spokesman 
of the government of Baden-Württemberg and the current CEO of the Baden-Württemberg Stiftung. He will introduce us with a few words in German and follow up by his responsible program manager, Ms. Cosima Weyers. Bitte begrüßt mit mir mit einem tobenden Applaus Herr Christopher Dahl. Herzlich willkommen. Ich begrüße Sie sehr herzlich, Frau Beladine Schatt, Frau Miet, liebe Gäste und liebes Team der Kanzgarage. Das ist ein bisschen schwierig mit meinem Skript, aber wir kriegen es hin. Also im Namen der Baden-Württemberg-Stiftung heiße ich Sie herzlich willkommen zur heutigen Veranstaltung, die wir gemeinsam mit Women in AI and Robotics im Rahmen unseres Programms KI-Garage organisiert haben. Mit unserem Programm KI-Garage unterstützen wir Gründerwillige, schönes Wort, Gründungswillige, dabei innovative Ideen im Bereich künstliche Intelligenz mit Hilfe von Beratungs- und Schulungsangeboten zu tragfähigen Geschäftsmodellen weiterzuentwickeln. Also wer gründungswillig ist und was Tragfähiges liefert, wird gefördert. So sieht's aus. Heute Abend beschäftigen wir uns mit der Frage, wie mit Hilfe von künstlicher Intelligenz die Nachhaltigkeitsziele erreicht werden können. In unserem sogenannten Netzwerk Accelerator haben wir unter anderem auch drei KI-Startups unterstützt, die durch ihre Produkte Nachhaltigkeit fördern. Nächste Seite folgt. Das Team Fabrix hat ein Qualitätskontrollsystem für Textilnähte entwickelt. Die Vision ist, eine ressourceneffiziente und nachhaltige Produktion in der Textilindustrie zu etablieren. Ein System zur Messung des privaten Wasserverbrauchs hat das Team Hydrop Water Systems entwickelt. Über eine App werden der Verbrauch überwacht und personalisierte Hinweise zur Reduzierung gegeben. Und dann das dritte Team Green Vision möchte mit künstlicher Intelligenz Schädlinge in der Landwirtschaft durch ein Kamerasystem erkennbar machen. Damit sollen die Ausbreitung der unerwünschten Kleinstlebewesen verhindert und letztendlich Ernteverlusten oder einem übermäßigen Einsatz von Pestiziden entgegengewirkt werden. Mit der KI-Garage möchten wir zudem nachhaltige und dauerhafte Geschäftsmodelle entwickeln. Die Baden-Württemberg-Stiftung, der Baden-Württemberg-Stiftung liegen die Themen Nachhaltigkeit und Klimaschutz besonders am Herzen. Wir wollen unser Bundesland auf dem Weg zur Klimaneutralität begleiten und die Menschen im Südwesten mit einer Vielzahl von Angeboten dabei unterstützen, Klimaschutz zu einem festen Bestandteil ihres Alltags zu machen. Beispielsweise in unseren Programmen Nachhaltigkeit lernen, mobiles Baden-Württemberg, Gesellschaft und Natur oder Klimaanpassung. Also eine Vielzahl von Programmen. Ein, das Thema Nachhaltigkeit äh, verfolgen wir schon seit sicher über zehn Jahren. Mit der Klimaschutzstiftung in Baden-Württemberg haben wir die ist als Unterstiftung der Baden-Württemberg-Stiftung zum 1. Januar eingerichtet, werden außerdem Programme zum Klimaschutz in den Bereichen Bildung und Forschung umgesetzt. Und nun zum Schluss. Im Sinne der Nachhaltigkeit und der Klimaneutralität haben wir für Sie einige überwiegend vegane und vegetarische Gerichte bereitgestellt. Ich hoffe, die schmecken auch. Ich als Fleischfresser ich habe da immer meine Bedenken, aber ich bin überzeugt, bei unserem guten Keterer sind Sie wirklich gut bedient. Anschließend möchte ich mich noch für die Organisation des heutigen Abends beim Team des, der KI-Garage bedanken, sowie bei Frau Miet und Herrn Feigelmann für die Moderation. Und damit wünsche ich uns allen einen spannenden, erfolgreichen Abend. Viel Spaß und jetzt hören Sie alles nochmal auf Englisch. Bitte Frau Bayers. So welcome, a warm welcome for me as well. As mentioned, I will give a short English summary for all the non-German speakers. As um, Mr. Dahl mentioned, our program, the KI Garage, um, is to, uh, we support young researchers to develop their ideas in the field of artificial intelligence into viable business models. Um, by providing consulting and training sessions. 
In the context of tonight's event, Mr. Dahl mentioned that we had three startups in our so-called um, accelerator um, program that promote sustainabil uh, sustainability through their products. The first team, Fabrics, has developed a quality control system for textile seams. Their vision is to establish a more resource efficient and sustainable production in the textile industry. The um, second team, a system of measuring private water consumption has been developed by Hydro Water Systems. They have an app which is used to monitor consumption and provide personalized advice on how to reduce it. The third team, Green Vision, wants to use artificial intelligence to make pests in agriculture detectable through a camera system. This should prevent the spread of the unwanted microorganisms and ultimately counteract crop losses or excessive use of pesticides. Mr. Dahl also emphasized that the goal of our, that, or, or one goal of our program is to develop sustainable and lasting business models with the KI Garage. He also pointed out this, that sustainability and climate protection is a very important topic for the Baden-Württemberg Stiftung. For example, we have various programs about these topics. Our so-called Klimaschutzstiftung, which was established as a sub-foundation on January 1st, um, 2021 also implements climate protection programs in the areas of education and research. So, and um, after the uh, keynote, as you already said, there's a um, wide option of vegan and um, vegetarian um, snacks for you prepared. So, um, hope you enjoy the food for tonight and I wish you a great evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Weyers, Mr. Dahl. And now let's get to our second very important partner of today's event, um, Women in AI and Robotics. And um, as we have learned over the past two years to work uh, on a hybrid mode, we prepared a short video. Please, a big applause for their president, Mrs. Sheila beladini -Jatt. Hello and a warm welcome to the community of Stuttgart. I am so excited to have you with us today to celebrate many new milestones together. This is our very first in-person event in Germany, and what better place to hold it than in Baden Württemberg, where not only do we have an amazing community, partners and supporters, but are also excited for the future plans of Baden Württemberg in artificial intelligence and innovation. Exciting times are ahead of us. Additionally, the topic of utilizing AI to address SDG goals is very fitting since we are celebrating our one year anniversary of becoming UN Women Coalition Partners and making formal commitments as an association representing Germany. Since the founding of Women in AI and Robotics in 2021, we have accomplished a lot together. We are now over 750 members strong with chapters across Germany and Canada and a presence at a global level. Our mission is to take actionable and measurable steps to reduce the gender gap in artificial intelligence and robotics. We have developed educational programs, conducted workshops, held many technical events, mentored many women in our communities, and trained 40 women to become entrepreneurs in AI. We could not have done this without the great support of our members, our amazing volunteers, partners, and supporters. Gender inequality needs immediate action. We cannot wait for 100 years to reach equality. It needs to be expedited. And it is possible to do so if only we join hands and work together. This first in-person event today and your presence is a testament to what can be achieved when we come together 
as individuals, nonprofits, corporations, or government agencies, for we all play an important role in expediting the process. Special thank you to our guests, Professor Jivka of Chekova, Patricia Mook, Marcel Isbert and Johannes Braun, Mikhail Dietz, our partner AI Garage, Mikhail Figelman, Patrick Wiedmann, Robert Dehkan, our sponsor Shifting Baden Wuttenberg, Mr. Christopher Dahl, Ms. Kazima Weers, Team Stuttgart, Karina Miet, Sanya Akhtar, Nina Schaaf, Mireika Kreshmar, and Anna Maria Christou. I hope to be there with you next time. And I leave you with my favorite quote from Rosemary Brown. We must open the doors and we must see to it that they remain open so that others can pass through. Thank you so much and see you next time. Bye-bye. So thank you very much, Sheila. Virtually, she is currently in uh, Canada, I think. And now we will move on to the main part of our event and with the first contents of tonight. And I would like to introduce you the director of the FZE in Karlsruhe. She is an engineer enthusiast, professor, and a science for life practitioner. Please welcome on stage Professor Dr. Yivka Ovcharova. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you today, and especially because we see so many young women. It's uh, incredible. So I know this from uh, my praxis as a professor, and I'm always happy now to, to, uh, to talk to such enthusiastic uh, um, uh, people. So um, the topic is uh, sustainability. For sure, sustainability is the most important uh, uh, topic we have to manage uh, and it's not just uh, nice to have topic but it's uh, really very um, very strong uh, str strong uh, topic to uh, not only to talk but also to practice and uh, I will talk about uh, different approaches towards uh, finding solutions to sustainable operations uh, and AI is one of this uh, technology but also interlinked to other very potential also really high potential technologies like uh, virtual reality and digital twins. Um, because uh, this is a very uh, large topic, I just put two, three questions and I will try to answer these three questions uh, in 15 minutes. So. Uh, let's start with the first question. Why do we talk about uh, sustainable operations, uh, sustainability? Um, the usual representation is for sustainability is there is a building with three pillars. Uh, three interlinked, uh, interlinked domains uh, of, um, um, of bi-directional, uh, multi-directional influence of uh, society, ecology, uh, and uh, economy. And uh, um, today we um, are talking about sustainability because um, we have to ensure a way of working and living which is not um, um, putting in dangerous situation the future generations, which is, uh, for first time, a very, very tough topic for, for us. Um, and uh, looking on this uh, slide, uh, you see that uh, we are talking about sustainability, but we are living um, in a, um, an environment which is driven by uh, material resources and tangible assets. Um, and uh, what should be changed uh, um, uh, radically is really the way how do we create value. Uh, we cannot um, create value in future just uh, by uh, material growth. It, material, uh, it is possible to have a growth of our economy without to use materials. That means uh, um, our uh, understanding uh, is uh, that uh, there are some <laughs> Switches in the slides, uh, slides which are not, uh, and, uh, I apologize for that. Um, the, the changes are accelerating, so 
um, faster um, and higher, farther, where to go, who is giving our the direction, as, as the direction for the transformation. My interpretation, not only interpretation, but I'm quite uh, convinced that uh, in future we have really to put more attention and more focus in our actions on creating value using intangible uh, assets. That means all what is not touchable, what is not per, what we cannot see, but what is really will drive uh, us, uh, our life and our uh, future. Uh, and uh, um, we, this is a huge mar market. Uh, the market, um, using now the example of AI, is that um, we expect uh, until in three years, um, by the way, in three years a market of uh, over 105 billions of dollars using just AI. Um, and uh, this is the fastest growing market or with business opportunities uh, in such a fast changing economy. Um, let's start now with uh, um, the topic of our uh, evening, um, how to drive the changes towards uh, sustainability. And uh, I cannot talk in general, I will just focus uh, one of the important goals related to our industrial development. Uh, and um, for first time since over 200 years, uh, we have to deal with reduction of material resources. Um, looking on the development in the last two, uh, 200 years and uh, three uh, industrial revolutions, we um, use it most and most materials, mechanization, electrification, automation. Now it's the time to, ch to switch from the global economy we created in the 70s to a smart economy. Because as I said, we cannot anymore physically grow. We can grow uh, intangible, but not physically. And for this reason, talking about making the economy from global to more smarter means to include also the human in the loop. As you see in the, in the last 20, 200 years, uh, machines uh, some way replaced humans. Uh, and uh, now is the time that the humans came back in the middle of the, um, um, of the activities and we understand cyberization as an interlinkage of machines, AI, and humans in so-called ecosystem. This is what already uh, we use it, just uh, one of the most uh, um, uh, important terms uh, concerning the actions of the, um, um, of the AI garage. How to manage the um, sustainable development goals related to the change of the industry, the infrastructure, and it, how to drive innovation. As I said, I see the future just in putting the intangible assets in the, in the center of consideration as the biggest um, business opportunity for the future. Well, it's nice to talk about that, but the question is how to realize it. So, um, there are important, powerful technologies uh, like um, artificial intelligence, uh, virtual reality, and digital twin. And because we talk about changing in that industry, infrastructure, innovation towards intangible assets, that means in future to put the more stress of the real-time networking of objects with uh, services and with humans. The real time will play a very important role because, as I said, the acceleration of the changes is going faster and faster. And uh, that means uh, real time applications will be really the main way of uh, applications we, will, we have to run uh, in the future. We don't have uh, time to wait. But the technology is not changing the, the, the world itself. The technology can be um, uh, can bring advantages if people use this technology. Then we can change uh, the way how do we work and uh, uh, our business only if we use this technology in the right way. And um, let's uh, talk now about the three technologies I just uh, introduced, it, uh, not introduced, but mentioned it, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and digital twin, to understand what is behind these uh, technologies and what is the real meaning of these technologies. Because in most of the cases, these technologies, these names, artificial intelligence, digital twin, and virtual reality, they are some sensational terms. But what means that? Starting with artificial intelligence. Well, uh, looking in the past, uh, and uh, I am active in this area, I follow the development of artificial intelligence since uh, many years. 
the beginning was driven by computer scientists um, trying to improve the intelligence of machines, of computers. Talking about um, von Neumann, von Alan Turing, and John McCarthy. Um, they are um, pushing the development of the computer technologies and intelligence of computers, uh, introducing complex automate theory. But this theory was just understandable for few experts. And in order to make this technology more popular, John, um, John Mac uh, Mac McCarthy introduced the term artificial intelligence. And this is, of course, a very um, attractive term. But uh, what is behind it? Behind it is a machine intelligence, it's a computer intelligence. And this intelligence is still what we, d uh, we do now. Talking about artificial intelligence is just improving the intelligence of computers. Um, what, uh, I don't know if you uh, saw this very famous uh, discussion, controversial discussion of uh, Jack Ma and uh, Elon Musk uh, in uh, Shanghai uh, in August uh, um, 19. So uh, they agree just in one point. They agree just in one point that uh, there is no uh, real forecast possible for, for the artificial intelligence. And they completely disagree about the future of, uh, com uh, of artificial intelligence. That means there are many, um, many topics to think on. Uh, and um, where we are today? Today, talking about artificial intelligence means that we use algorithms for recognizing regularities or patterns uh, in learning data. Well, um, during a um, visit uh, of Mr. Um, um, Hofmeister crowds uh, with the delegation in China. We made some tests, um, and uh, what you see in the middle is just I tested just a system in uh, in Shenzhen uh, of uh, recognizing or matching me with another person. What you see is just that algorithms do not work in the right way because I was matched to 70% with this guy, which is a man with dark uh, skin without hair. So. I think that uh, these algorithms were really not so, uh, so successful. But um, today, as I said, we can uh, work if we have a huge amount, uh, huge amount of data, uh, which is already a problem. And as I said, it's not so difficult to search for patterns we already know. So to so search for cat or for dog is not the challenge. The challenge is for the industry. The challenge is to have solutions for real world problems. And these problems are strongly related really to the, to the production. Uh, we need to learn in connected cyber physical systems. Uh, we need data coming from different uh, sources, different type of sensors. And also we have to work on the topic of real time making decisions, not after training, uh, the, uh, training the, the neural networks for a long time which takes also a lot of computational power. As this is what we learned today, that uh, uh, it is not really uh, just um, uh, computer resources are not unlimited, and they cost a lot of energy. So uh, the future belongs to AI, but AI means not artificial intelligence. AI means augmented intelligence of machines and of humans. I, was, I had the pleasure to um, talk um, to Gary Kasparov uh, two years ago, and uh, he is uh, re very, really very much uh, pushing this, uh, this perspective uh, of uh, putting more the intelligence of humans and machine together and not uh, talking about artificial intelligence against the human intelligence. This is absolutely not our goal. Um, I brought just one simple example, how to use AI here in a combination with augmented reality, which is uh, what was a bachelor thesis of a young guy. A young guy, he was so successful that he, he created his one company. Uh, the, the name of the company is Kimono, and if you like to learn more about Kimono, just look on the homepage. Uh, he just uh, uses artificial intelligence to recognize um, different uh, parts, mechanical parts. We can have a thousand of parts. Uh, if, if they are not structured and organized in a way, then it's very difficult to find these parts. And uh, using augmented reality um, glasses and uh, AI algorithms, uh, he's, uh, um, he's able for 
a very short time to find the right parts, uh, the right parts to, um, to um, assemble this uh, mostly uh, electronic and mechatronic components uh, um, and uh, work uh, directly after a short time. Um, let's talk now about virtual reality. Um, I am involved in this area since uh, 93, so I was one of the first uh, who visited the first cave in uh, Illinois State University of Chicago, 93, and I am fascinated, still very, very fascinated and involved in this development. Uh, what is virtual reality? Again, I mean, looking uh, in the um, 50s, uh, in uh, 80s, uh, the last century, um, um, the work was done uh, on the topic of hardware and software, specialized software to create the so-called virtual environment display system, which is a very precise um, term um, about what, which work was done. Um, but this term was known just for experts. Uh, and this development was pushed very strong uh, by the development uh, of, of NASA. So, and uh, just to make this uh, term more attractive, um, um, General, Jérôme Lanier uh, just uh, said, let's call it virtual reality. But this is even not his uh, um, term. The term virtual reality came from science fiction, uh, from Damon Roderick, who introduced this term in uh, 82. So, and since uh, 1989, uh, um, the virtual reality is some way a famous, uh, famous area. And uh, I am personally very unsatisfied by the media because they use this term to, um, to show that uh, we use virtual reality for just for, um, for fun, for computer games and so on. And uh, I am really not... Um, um, I, I do not agree with this. The, the, this is not what the media make uh, out of this term, uh, especially a metaverse. Um, you know, we are not talking about different realities. We have just one reality, and this reality is expanding. So our understanding from reality is expanding because we, with uh, with virtual reality and other. Um, form of realities in sense technical creation of the transition from completely virtual to completely physical, we have different steps, then uh, our perception of this world is changing and our possibilities to see more of the invisible, the touch, the intouchable is growing up. So we have just one reality. We don't have a parallel universe like metaverse, uh, metaverse says, says us. I call this XR. XR is the reality of the expanding co uh, co uh, continuum. Uh, this is a continuum from 100% uh, percent synthesized reality, which we call virtual reality on the left side, uh, until the mixed reality where we have the coexistence of physical and virtual reality. In the middle, we have the augmented virtuality. That means the points we see are scan data from the reality. You use just a three-dimensional scanner. And uh, if you scan a building, then uh, um, you can merge the uh, physical reality, the scan of the physical reality with, uh, with the model which do not exist now of a building. So that means the colored, uh, um, colored uh, elements are um, CD, elements of CD model, something which do not exist. And the scan points are um, get from the physical reality. And we have the augmented reality in the opposite. We are more in the physical reality, but we can put uh, some annotations uh, and uh, um, extend this uh, physical reality with some uh, valuable information. The mixed reality, as I said, is the co co uh, coexistence uh, of both realities, where the both realities can, can, can influence each other, that physical and virtual reality, like a driving simulator and flying simulator. As an example of, from our research, um, which is, by the way, the PhD of Angela, which is a very, very talented young woman, um, we talk, show how to use virtual reality for the so call it asymmetric uh, virtual collaboration as a service. What, what means this? This means that if you have uh, one round site, a production plant with physical machines and service providers which are sitting probably many kilometers far from this, uh, from this plant, then the service provider do, do, do not have the machines, but have the machines just digitally. And can um, 
um, in give instruction to the engineer on the plant side how to run the physical machine. Therefore, we say um, this is a, a asymmetric uh, virtual collaboration, but there are many other fine uh, types of uh, collaboration we uh, are studying. And the digital twin, it is a new, um, relatively new term since uh, 20 years. Um, my colleague, um, and Michael Grease, uh, teaching uh, product lifecycle management, uh, this is what I also teach at KIT, um, used the term digital twin just to give it, uh, to, to explain it in a more simple way to the students, um, how the physical and virtual uh, worlds belong together um, in the life cycle, product life cycle. So uh, this is um, the approach to unify in some way to, to bring these two worlds together. And if you really want to learn more about uh, digital twins, then I highly recommend you um, look on what uh, Michael Reeves is telling. He is, there are many speeches of him. Uh, and you will get information just from the source. Because there are many, very many, many interpretations of digital twin. Of course, we are talking about bidirectional connectivity. This is the most essential part of the digital twins, not just having uh, uh, geometry in some way um, at any time. And this is what, where we are today. So that means the problem today is that uh, many suppliers of CAD systems, for example, or other IT systems, they just use existing geometry or put some attributes or use offline simulation and say we have a digital twin. And this is not true because what is missing is the synchronization between uh, physical and virtual world uh, in a given uh, level of accuracy in a given time. So it doesn't mean it doesn't means that if we work on a um, car project that we always need the digital twin of the entire car. We can work on the chassis, we can work on the machine, machine uh, uh, engine or on the battery, but uh, it depends on the on the contents. In, in, it depends on the application. Uh, this is very important. So what should we take uh, into consideration in future? To have digital twins working in a productive way for the industry, we need to keep uh, the standards, the norms. So, as an example, RAMI, the reference model for Industry 4.0. We have to teach the right skills to prepare the, the, the employees for working with digital twins and implement it always in the praxis to get more closer to the real applications. Uh, and. Um, one of the central statements concerning uh, digital twins is to implement digital twins, we have to work on the concept back end, front end. Then the back end is where we have the data, infrastructure, machines. Uh, they are hidden for the, the people because of the complexity. And um, we should put more attention on the front end, where are the humans with their experiences, emotions, and uh, the way how they make decisions. Uh, the digital twin is some way the orchestrator of this both uh, of services of the back side and front side. So, um, as a last example, also from uh, our uh, from the KIT, uh, students uh, implemented the concept of digital twin only the front end. The back end is too much complex. I will not now provide you many details about that, but you see how simple um, he can um, produce with a virtual milling machine um, VR with Smiley. So, and once the machine finishes the operation, the virtual machine switches on the physical machine. The physical machine produces exactly what he produced. As I said, the student do not need to know all details about the back end, but it is the way how humans work with uh, and solve problems of complexity. Um, this is the whole team participated in this, um, um, uh, in this project. And you see on the other side, the physical machine is already working and producing what was done uh, virtually. So um, how to implement sustainable operation? My time is finished, so my time finished already. So I uh, just, uh, just uh, um, invite you to visit our YouTube channel. 
We have uh, many, many examples, uh, also with uh, cooperation with industrial partners, but also from our educational process, uh, where we, you will uh, see um, examples also in the area of uh, renewable energy, um, in the area of sustainable um, buildings, uh, um, so on. Um, and probably I can give you some details during the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Um, as you see, uh, we demonstrate our results always in terms of videos because in this way we can show what we implemented. We do not just use slides, uh, that, uh, some pictures, but we show our results. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, please stay for one or two more questions. Um, so. Dear audience, if you have now one or two specific questions to the keynote of Ms. Ovcharova, then is now your time. A lot of valuable content, but, but now we will move on then to the panel. And in the meantime of our next video, um, we will do the setup of the panel and invite every of our panelists on stage after the video. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed the video. It was just finished uh, yesterday, I guess. So it's really fresh and just prepared for this event. And uh, yeah, now we are uh, continuing with a main topic, uh, namely the keynote, uh, the panel discussion <laughs> on how we can reach the SDGs 
with AI. And for this, I will invite uh, our uh, panelists uh, up here. And first panelist is Jivka of Charofa. You already know her. But I have some more facts about her. <laughs> so she holds three uh, uh, PhDs, one in computer science, one in mechanical engineering, and one honorary degree from the Technical University of Sofia. So very impressed by that because I'm still struggling to get my first one. And uh, yeah, if you missed the, uh, um, the key, uh, QR code, uh, you can search for Institute for Information Management in Engineering uh, from the KIT where she is a professor. And she also founded a center for artificial intelligence talents and an industry 4.0 collaboration lab and a life cycle engineering solution center. So she's a really busy lady and we are very happy to have her here, not only for our keynote, but also for our panel. So join me on stage. Um, the next panelist is Patricia Moog. She's an expert in sustainability, transformation, and the SDGs. And she makes sustainability tangible. We heard already that we also need to do things intangible, but in this case, it's good to have it tangible. And uh, she founded 4L Impact Strategy, a consultancy that, um, that supports the clients on their sustainability journey. And uh, her background is in chemical and process engineering at KIT. And she has several years of experience working in the industry, so she knows exactly where to pull the levers. So please join me on stage. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, we have Michael Dietz with us. He started his career at SAP, worked in different stations from consulting to full stack development, and he also holds lectures on mobile app development at the Duale Hochschule Baden-Württemberg. Since 2018, he's working at Google Cloud, where he helps his customers leverage cloud technology for sustainability. I'm sure he will tell us more about that in the panel discussion. So welcome, Michael, with a warm applause. So last week, um, the SDG report was released and it showed that uh, COVID-19 and uh, war in, um, the Russian war in the Ukraine, Ukraine have led to setbacks in reaching the uh, sustainability goals. So my first question goes to you, Patricia. Why are the SDGs so important, especially in these days? How much time do I have to answer <laughs> this question? <laughs> Uh, well, it's uh, it's extremely important, and I'm I'm actually personally really sad that we have not um, achieved the SDGs in a, or that we are not making progress on the SDGs. The last two years have been extremely, um, yeah, extremely hard for businesses, for governments, for all, but also the civil um, uh, civilians and individual persons. And for me, it's really hard to see that we have not made any progress on the SDGs within the last two years. And um, basically, the SDGs are the closest thing that we have to a global strategy and a global vision on sustainability. And we all need to act on that as governments, as businesses, individual persons, and everyone. And also, research plays a huge role, and I guess also AI could really yeah, speed up the process and in reaching and achieving the SDGs. Yeah, of course it can and maybe Michael can jump in right there. So you work on sustainability projects in the area of AI at Google Cloud. So maybe you can uh, um, share some insights about a project that you did that is um, paying into the SDGs. Okay, I have one thing in mind that I would, would highlight here. Uh, so one project we are working on is is a, is is a visual inspection or visual kind of machine learning algorithm that we have used to train a model with our company or partner that we are working uh, with that's Lush. So Lush is the, the company that uh, provides the stores with the bath soaps and all that kind of stuff. And it, it was a, a visual model that helps the a user or a customer to go into the store and identify products even without any packaging. Okay, so. Um, that is where, where, for sure, it directly impacts the kind of waste reduction and stuff like that. And it's a, a, mo a project I was working on and basically supported a company in making that happen that maybe in the future the store can even have no waste in, in total, so completely reduce that. That's 
one of the examples, yeah. Very cool. And uh, you also shared some examples in your keynote, but if we always hear of these great um, yeah, advancements in research and so on, how do you make sure that your research comes to a company like Google or other partners in the industry that we really can use the knowledge and make a positive impact on sustainability? What happened in the last uh, three years when the pandemic and now it's, uh, the, the, the conflicts so which is changing the way of uh, living and working in the world, it's, it's not only in Europe, shows us that we cannot run the globalization like we have done it before. So therefore I said we have to work on more smart uh, methods of using less uh, materials, uh, be less dependent on material flow. Uh, like um, in the global uh, supplier, supplier chains, for example, we missed a lot in the last time. Uh, and um, we work in the research exactly on new methods. Um, I especially uh, am now my most uh, biggest uh, research uh, project on regional digital ecosystems. That means um, the future is really to work more decentralized, um, to, uh, to start to use the resources in the regions much more effectively, and to work on a regional level is much easier to, br to bring digital services to everybody than to work uh, uh, only on global level. Um, and uh, how do we practice this as we work very tight together with the industry because uh, uh, bachelor and master theses are um, usually done in a cooperation with the industry, with large companies but also small companies. Uh, and uh, this showed to us that um, we work, um, you know, we feel which are the most essential problems to cover with, uh, with such theses and uh, other the other aspect is, of course, as I mentioned, it, um, just to teach new skills. We, um, we do not teach just knowledge. Knowledge is not enough. We have to practice knowledge. So we need new skills for the new generation of employees uh, because we see that there is a huge um, um, request on, of uh, well-educated people for new professions. Uh, and uh, this is the way how do we um, uh, how do we approach uh, the, uh, the goals of the sustainable development, um, which, as I said before in the workshop, uh, um, are, it is not, not possible to, just to talk uh, about isolated goals, but we have always to interrelate. Yeah, exactly. And uh, sometimes even uh, startups, as you mentioned, are a way to um, yeah, bring the research into practice. And Michael, um, you are also working with uh, especially startups in the domain of AI. Maybe you can comment a little bit on that and also you can jump in on why you need to found a sustainability consultancy. So Yeah, so, so my, in my daily job, I'm basically supporting um, startups in Germany or in the DACH region, so including Switzerland and Austria, um, that are interested in using our technology, especially AI technology, um, to do any kind of use case and any kind of business. But for sure, I'm dedicated, I have a dedicated focus on, on companies that also have a sustainability impact. Um, stuff like I don't know, Planetly is a, is a very interesting one that does more like the reporting piece of stuff, but I also have uh, some smaller startups that are interested in um, evaluating the 1.5 degree goal of, um, of buildings, for example, of companies itself, but they are strongest in buildings. Um, that's a company from Frankfurt called Right Based on Science. That's their full name. Um, and that, that's very interesting then to see how we can enable them to do then the... the yeah, sustainability topics, drive them forward, bring them into market, so. Yeah, I think that is something you have in common because we have to enable the companies to go on this journey, right? Exactly, this is, I think, one of the huge challenges to bring AI technology and the knowledge and the skills together with sustainability. And what I also see is decision makers in companies are not educated enough to take decisions with AI or with even within sustainability and sustainability I guess is a lot longer around now than AI and uh, we have to accelerate that together I guess with the research with already acceleration programs and bring this together and make it mandatory that these things are thought together and trained and taught together. Yeah. 
Exactly. But there still is a problem that everyone is now talking about how we can use AI, but uh, some of the companies out there are still struggling in getting their digitization journey uh, yes. on the right way. Um, so, um, yeah, both are needed, of course. We need digitization and AI to reach our climate targets, but aren't we overwhelming them with both at the same time? What do you think? <laughs> Well, I think that the problems are really not the methods uh, and the technology. I already used the term um, how, to, how to use it, uh, this technology, and uh, here we deal with the processes. Where we really need uh, a lot of attention uh, is how to implement uh, technologies and uh, methods uh, in, um, in practically in, uh, in different companies. And the companies, they have uh, some history. Uh, they are, have very, very specific uh, working environments and uh, infrastructure. So we have to approach these problems uh, very specifically. There are no universal uh, um, you know, recipes uh, how, to, how to implement artificial intelligence, especially in small medium sized companies. Therefore, uh, my advice is really to work together on, on, on site, uh, analyzing processes, Preparing teaching skills in the very, very important to prepare the employees and to, to also the decision makers to accept this technology. And uh, we are all humans. One, uh, one fact I can report uh, is uh, what is really makes us huge problems is the acceptance. The acceptance of using this technology, even this technology brings advantage because um, employees are afraid that they will lose their job if uh, we use more artificial intelligence. So they are really, this is a very, very complex uh, topic to be approached as a whole and not just talking about technology. Yeah, and there are not only prejudice about AI, also about sustainability, of course. Maybe <laughs> you can comment on that because yes. always people say, it's so expensive, we can't do this yes. this year with yeah. COVID and yeah. so on. Exactly. And what we need right now is business leaders who have the courage to also go into the direction of maybe unproven technology and maybe unproven transformation paths and, and processes. And it's for me so important to, but to enable the people in the company, the employees to be not afraid of sustainability and not go into that complex realm of then the dual transformation of digitization and sustainability at once in a company, which is why we integrate in our consultant in our consulting process always we have an academic or a training part for the employees. Um, and I think this is so integral for having the basically within a solution or a solution finding phase, giving them the education and the training and the skills they need, implement them directly in the dual transformation and then move on and find solutions for their own company because they have this, the, the, the sector knowledge, they have the knowledge of their, of their history of the company and to integrate that together. But um, yeah, you need courage to do that. That's for sure. So, um, yeah, the topic uh, today was uh, a lot focused on AI and sustainability. And if you look into the literature, there's always this debate, uh, sustainable AI versus AI for sustainability. And uh, yeah, this living debate um, is also done by some famous researchers, like for example, the AI ethicist Amy from Winsburg, and she's arguing that the sustainability of as uh, aspect of AI is often neglected because everyone is just focusing on how we can use AI for good, but then they just don't look at how much energy it consumes, for example. So Michael, what do you think about that, especially as a cloud uh, uh, solution provider, you have to consider this aspect a little bit more maybe than the others. Correct, and I recently did a talk about that because for sure that, that's an obvious topic. On the one hand side, we want to use AI for doing good and positive things in sustainability. On the other hand side, it impacts it directly because it has a climate and energy usage effective uh, or effect. Um, what's, the, what's the goal behind that? Or what's, what I'm doing is I, I teach, I work with companies and I teach them a little bit of best practices for how they can reduce the, the energy consumption or the overall resource consumption when they train machine learning models, when they put them into inference, so constantly using it. Um, so that, that's one topic that we call green ops, where we go in, into sp particular tips and tricks and teach everybody about these little kind of things. On the other hand side, um, 
With Google Cloud, we are investing also into the topic because sustainability is important, climate is important, energy efficiency is important. And what we have recently launched is a new generation of our product called TPU. So TPU is a tensor processing unit. So basically some kind of an accelerator like a GPU, but a little bit more effective. And then we have built it into a new server farm into our data center in, in Ohio, US. And the, the result is it's running at 90% carbon-free energy with a very high efficiency when you use these kind of accelerators. So there are many aspects to that. Um, and yeah, we try to also educate people around what can they do to, on a machine learning basis to, to improve and to reduce resource consumption. Oh. Okay, perfect. But that sounds like you solved already everything. There must be a challenge Definitely not. left. No, no, no. There's still a lot to do. And for sure, as machine learning is picking up, more and more resources are, are being acquired. So last year, we saw, for example, that the GPU market was um, nearly empty and there was capacity issues. Um, also because of Bitcoin mining and all the mining exercises that, that changed this year. So that's a good thing. Um, but with the growing need and use of machine learning, we will see that this is definitely making up a, a large portion of energy consumption in data centers. So that's why we constantly have to improve and, and solve new things. For sure. And uh, the others, do you also have uh, some challenges in mind that we currently have to uh, face or also uh, have to overcome in the area of AI and sustainability? <laughs> Um, Maybe I, uh, from the research perspective first and then from the strategy perspective yeah. next. <laughs> well, this is a very, very good question you said. Uh, what means using AI? Well, what we can improve uh, in terms of sustainability? And uh, I think that, uh, of course, data centers are very important. They are consuming a lot of energy, but uh, I'm not talking about only cloud computing. We will have uh, in the industry a much more um, edge computing. That means we will calculate on site, not in the cloud. So so anyhow, we will have, uh, we need huge computational resources in the future about what I'm talking about, intangible assets. And uh, this means that, uh, also talking about the three pillars, we have to ha change our behavior. It's not a question if Putin will, you know, uh, uh, not deliver any more gas to us. This is not a question. We have anyhow uh, to change our behavior uh, concerning the computational power in sense then just making pictures from the dinner and sending this to friends, you know, using WhatsApp or the other uh, messengers and so on, this, this costs energy. So sometimes we have really to think if it's necessary or not. We have to change our behavior. Um, because uh, um, our behavior now is uh, we feel, you know, if we do something wrong concerning material resources. We have to have the same feeling also talking about immaterial resources like data and computational power. The people do not see it, but we will have, we will have problems also at the energy for, uh, for uh, serving data centers and for all what we have in future to do, producing more as assets, uh, intangible assets. Yeah, for me, basically, I, to, to put it in a nutshell, I do not want, I also want to focus on the ethics part of AI and of course the energy related and the related um, um, GHG emissions is really important, but I also want to focus on, on ethics in AI with, I do not, I personally do not want to live in a world where AI is developed for um, socially judging people and putting them into into classes and into systems, and for me, this is this is one thing where I I, I really want to see improvement in the future. That AI is um, also in terms of the social sustainability um, a really good tool that we can use. Yeah, yeah exactly. There are some yeah. <laughs> And yeah, the last question for the panel um, today is uh, maybe I direct it directly to you, Jivka. So on the one hand, we know that uh, young women are predominantly engaged in the climate movement in Germany, for example. But on the other hand, if we look in the area of uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, the women are still underrepresented. So uh, is this now the chance that we inspire more women to start a career in AI? 
Well, uh, this, is, uh, this is the question why women are not represented, uh, not uh, sufficiently represented uh, in the AI area. We should not talk only about Germany. So in the other countries in this world, we have a very high percentage of women involved in, in uh, computer science, in engineering, in AI. Um, then um, this is uh, the reason in Germany are just stereotypes and tradition. I don't think that we have uh, some essential difficulties here to motivate young women for uh, you know uh, se selecting this way uh, as a profession. But uh, we have to work on this issue um, since the beginning. And I'm very much involved in, in these activities like uh, for responsible for gender um, issues at KIT in, in the past. Uh, and uh, it's a question really of, um, of uh, mentoring, of um, role models. Uh, in my lectures, I have uh, many women, more, uh, more than 40%. In my institute, I have uh, more than 50% women, and they do a great job. So uh, it's a question we do not have any difficulties uh, from, you know, of, uh, from nature we cannot solve. It's a question of uh, um, you know, taking out the old stereotypes, what uh, our professions for women uh, appropriate or not. And uh, also with this, uh, in this uh, relation, we have to also to create a new um, models of working, helping women to work, to work more free and uh, to um, also to see potential for leading positions. These are, again, many factors which are interlinked. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of uh, very positive examples uh, from other countries uh, uh, in Europe and in the world. I'm, for example, very, very um, impressed by how the countries like Singapore, um, even India and China manage these issues where we, I see much more women working in the area of AI than here uh, in Germany. So we have to work on. Yeah. And together with women in AI and robotics, we want to make that happen in the next years. So thanks a lot. Uh, please spend a warm applause to our panelists. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, some time for questions now, so uh, feel free to ask uh, anything you want. We have three experts here, and don't be shy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, maybe, I, I don't know if this is your area of expertise, but uh, maybe your personal opinion, because you, you, know, you talked about uh, courage of stepping up or measures. Uh, yeah, but what about uh, regular, uh, regulatory um, measures to enforce things because I mean um, technically in the 50s, 60s you called people hippies and today uh, technically we're electing them, right? So if you position yourself well, you can also welcome regulatory measures and, and be the smart person. So what, what are your views on, on advancing the field uh, that way, basically top down instead of uh, you know, creating incentives and hoping on goodwill because yeah, I don't know, we saw in the past with cars, emissions, and also, you know, COVID restrictions in England, for instance, that people don't even abide by the rules. So that seems like the smallest measure you have to do to enforce things. So uh, any of your opinions I would be interested in, just. Of course, I, I, I have an opinion on that. Uh, I guess we have to, like, everything has to be combined right now. We do not have, we do not, we simply do not have the time to wait longer. Policies have to be made. I'm right now EU taxonomy uh, with the decision to classify um, nuclear energy and gas energy as sustainable is uh, basically, I, I basically, that's not my opinion. I think it's very unsustainable. But in terms of the rest, the EU Green Deal is a really good measure to, in my opinion, to, to step forward and really direct flow of finances and of money towards a sustainable um, environment. And I guess we also as individuals have to step up, businesses have to step up, and everyone take the responsibility they have, basically. I guess it's a, it's a common work.
Yeah, maybe, maybe to add to that, so, so I, I see it important, yeah, but it's maybe more important to really put the responsibility, as you said, down to the individuals because we have to change ourselves. It doesn't make sense. Any people, some people will even not behave like regulatories want them to behave. They would even maybe do the other thing around. So um, we also need to think about how to teach every individual. I think we are good in, in some private areas, like how to put waste in the right waste bin, for example, that's everybody's teach. Um, but what we can teach, and that's what maybe you're good, doing a good job with companies, what can you do in your daily work life, right? What's, what's in, the bis in the business side of things, what you can change, what you can impact? Um, I think that, that is maybe a big area where we still can educate people, and a lot more areas. But I'm absolutely well, echoing your comments. Um, I think that one concrete approach uh, we will uh, implement in the next five years, uh, I mentioned the term uh, regional digital ecosystems. So uh, we talk about ecosystems, digital ecosystems, but um, we win at the project in Regio, Regio Win for five years uh, in the area of uh, Buell. Um, it's a small city, which um, it's, of course, we have to, um, to consider the role of the responsibility of the individual, but individuals should work um, together. Uh, and I think that really the best way, is in, in my opinion, I probably peers uh, later I will, I will be much more concrete, is um, to try to create a, a regional model as a digital ecosystem to study the influences uh, of interaction of people, technology involving uh, the society, um, the, the, the biggest player, the small companies, education and so on, to try to find solutions as much as possible on the regional level. And the advantage is this is very transparent. It's very close to the people. They know each other. And there are many advantages we can use to implement this digital ecosystem. So I'm very impressed with what in Switzerland is uh, implemented uh, in this sense. And uh, uh, I think that to solve global problems, we, can, we, we need to start, of course, in small steps. Each individual can try to do for himself some, to find some solution. But uh, we are not, uh, no, we do not live in isolation. And the region, uh, the region is, uh, uh, is a good uh, opportunity now to find solution um, for small town. And if it's work to, uh, to, to use this model to adapt it to other regions, of course, um, with uh, um, relevance to the, uh, to the goals and to the environment of this region. Um, as I said, I'm absolutely convinced that this could be a very, very um, appropriate model, um, what I said, to move from the globalization, the global globalization we know since uh, 50 years, but the globalization doesn't work anymore if you have a physical, if the physical communication is broken, and to concentrate on resilience models of four regions. So this could be a good approach to move towards smart economy. Thank you. So there was another question. Maybe you can direct it directly to yes, one of our I panelists. Can. Perfect, thanks. Uh, my name is Sven, and uh, I work quite a lot with uh, customers in the manufacturing industry. And uh, I have a specific question to you, Michael. Um, my experience over the past 20, 25, 30 years is that the uh, people in Germany especially um, avoid uh, moving to uh, new technologies. And in recent 10 years, we have major problems uh, convincing the people using cloud technology. And they might trust maybe Microsoft because they use the Office products, but they don't trust Google, they don't trust Amazon. And uh, I, I think when, what, what we learned in Jivka's uh, presentation, we need these infrastructure and these cloud-based infrastructures and technologies to even get there. And I have no idea how, how, how we can approach this because when, when I come to the companies, it's almost terrible that you have to explain, yeah, well, you use a network and use the internet. And it's just, uh, I feel helpless sometimes. And I would like to hear uh, what, what are you doing that the German industry, which are not moving to the cloud, uh, what we can do here. So I can give you my long pitch afterwards during the, the, the socializing networking session. Um, but no, nevertheless, um, I think we, we also have the same topics, especially manufacturing, um, where we have to 
step by step educate and talk again and talk again maybe if we have the time or we no i don't know the time but we, we go very often and we have a long cycle until we convince somebody um but we see a little bit of a trend going into the right direction let's say it this way but again other industries so fsi is an industry that now more and more picks up cloud and cloud public cloud providers and all that kind of stuff um, we have launched one particular kind of um, product, which is called a sovereign cloud, which is some kind of a more advanced security controlled cloud environment that also in, in regulated industry is very interesting. Um, long story short, we, we struggle the same, right? Or we have the same issues we can feel with you. Um, and step by step, hopefully we see a trend that goes into the right direction, but yeah. You're absolutely right. If you if you try to build in your own data centers and try to put many GPUs in there, that's on the one hand side not not economic anymore, but also from a sustainability perspective, that doesn't make any sense anymore because um, building your own data center is not not as energy efficient as a as a large one, and yeah, you have a lot of embodied carbon standing around. So that's why also from that perspective, it it's it would be interesting to move these people. Um, my name is Kirsten, and uh, I'm pretty interested in this war I don't know um, if this is uh, a topic that is really used uh, also for sustainability reasons. Um, so recently, I heard that. Yeah, recently, I heard that um, in health in the healthcare sector, you used it. For example, that um, all hospitals all over the world can participate, and just um, don't upload their sensitive data, but still share um, the trained models. Is that something that um, yeah, is already thought of in, in terms of sustainability? Yeah, so I'm looking into that. But that that's on our side a term federated learning, where you basically distribute not the data to a central point, but you distribute the model learning into the hospitals or something. Um, and yes, at the end, it's, it's some approach where you can say, because every single hospital is only, is only training on a limited amount of data, it's something that uses the, the carbon emissions cost in the hospital by electricity usage. But if you sum it up at the end, it's a similar kind of amount because you're training on a total same amount of images. So at the end, the, the, the formula is that it, at least from an energy consumption perspective, ends up in a similar dimension. So um, yeah, not, not making a big difference. That points to your question. But I, I'm only, I was only looking into energy consumption and resource consumption. But the leading fact behind that is data privacy concerns, right? That's, that's the important piece why we do that. We do that because data stays where it is, and you still have the ability to train a global machine learning model without moving data into other companies, regulatory areas, and whatever. Okay. So any other questions can be transferred to the networking session. All the panelists stay a little longer, I guess, and just feel free to connect with them. They are happy for your questions. And yeah, please give another big round of applause to our panelists. And I learned a lot today. I hope you all had an amazing uh, yeah, experience here with the workshops at the beginning, with our keynote and also the panel discussion and take home a lot of insights from today. And uh, at the end, I have a little announcement uh, from the women in the AI and uh, robotics community. So in August on the 13th, it's a Saturday, we have our next networking event and it starts at uh, uh, 5 p.m. and we will uh, do a picnic. So if you want to join us for a casual meeting where we just chat and eat some things, uh, just join us. Uh, we will announce the details on our uh, Discord server. So this is a benefit for our community members. And yeah, so that's the last thing for today. Uh, I can only say it was great to be your host for uh, this uh, event. And the snacks will be in the back and the drinks. So I hope to see you next time again if we have a, another great event like this. So thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>